contrario. Committee, I'll call it to order. Mr. Maroon, if you could find a seat. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Just looking for the end of the bench of the Yankees dugout. Uh, okay, the first item I got is a special permit for a restaurant and property located at 402 Frank, South Franklin Street. And we have Heather, Ms. Limandella from uh, Zoning. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, so this is in Franklin Square and this is an existing restaurant that's expanding into another space and uh, expanding the restaurant. Right. And it's Mar Margarita's? What, what's yes. it called? Yes. yes. Okay. And I've looked over the plans and everything. I have no issues with it. And since I'm the, any of my fellow counselors have any issues with it, no, it's okay. <clears throat> There's not a, another member of the uh, Economic Development Committee here. So <laughs> let's go to the next item. All right. Uh, special permit, this is 2118 East Genesee Street. And this is for housing. This is for offices okay. and um, apartments upstairs too, right? Well, the special permit was just for offices uh, to establish this because it is a residential B zoning district. And um, yes, there's 915 square feet of office in suite B and 10, uh, 1,061 of office in suite one. So uh, there are three dwelling units on the second floor. Okay. Like to purchase, um, the county actually already has a contract for this software, so we'll be able to piggyback off of their existing contract. Um, and this is uh, for software which is called B2G now. It's kind of the industry standard software that states and local governments use to manage their MWBE compliance program. So it automates a lot of those processes um, and it makes it a lot more efficient and effective to run those programs. And I think folks will recall that our city auditor did a program audit of the MWBE program last year and recommended that we pursue this software. So we believe we can, um, for the first year, allocate ARPA funds. Um, it'll be about $70,000, which is initial setup, as well as the first year license fees for the software. Um, and then starting in the next fiscal year, we would build this into our city budget, um, and it would be about $35,000 recurring um, annually. Okay. And this would be used in the Joint School Construction Board and all that, right? Exactly. The JSCB, but also, you know, all of the city contracts that um, are subject to MWBE. I think everyone will recall we added professional services contracts to the MWBE um, ordinance. So as more of those um, come up, those will be subject as well. Okay. Any questions from my colleagues? No, I appreciate that okay. because that's Very something good. I have been pushing for a while. Okay. Councilor Hogan, before you move on, did we do the special permit for the um, amusement? 
I only have the two, I have two letters. I have a special permit for uh, Franklin Street and a special permit for 2118 East Genesee Street. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm hearing no questions. Well, we'll go okay. to the next one. It's uh, appropriations of funds for, uh, oh, it's the same one, $70,000. Okay. This is the Downtown Revitalization yeah. Initiative. Excellent. All right, counselors, thank you. So the next item is um, a request for permission to apply for a grant uh, through uh, Empire State Development for their Downtown Revitalization Initiative. I think folks are probably familiar with this initiative. It's been around for about five years. This is where the state uh, provides $10 million in funding to a very specific target district within the city, uh, basically focused on business corridor revitalization. So they say downtown revitalization, it doesn't necessarily mean the core business district, it really means you know, a commercial district that we could make the argument has a you know, downtown kind of walkable um, feel where we can encourage and create better density. Um, that's sort of the objective of the program. Um, we, we've looked at various options to pursue this funding, um, and we believe the best location to target for this year's application is the area that's outlined on the map that I um, handed out, which essentially extends from the south of downtown, essentially along West Onondaga, and then along South Ave. I think folks will recall we did a business corridor study about two years ago with Kamoyne Associates. They gave us a lot of really great um, recommendations for the uh, revitalization of these business corridors. Um, and in addition, one of the really key things about this program is that we have to have um, uh, enough shovel-ready projects that are kind of in the pipeline for the next two, three years uh, to be able to qualify for the program. And so um, this was a, a big reason why we identified this target area in particular, because uh, we know there are several developments that are um, getting organized at the moment. <laughs> we just had one come before the land. Yes. Yes. And uh, I'd like to commend all the city departments that have really been committed to this corridor, this West Onondaga Street. It's, it, it's great that everybody's sort of coming together. And I couldn't, uh, of course, this is in the second council district, too. So, <laughs> so I couldn't be uh, more happy about this. And uh, there any of my colleagues have any questions regarding this? Is, is this still a $10 million application? Is that where it is that number remained the same as always? It is, yeah. In fact, this year, the state is making uh, double the resources available to the regions. So yes. each region can nominate two uh, cities, essentially, for these funds. So we have basically a 50% a better uh, chance of getting it this year, I guess. What's particularly uh, I'd like to point out is there's a lot of business folks in there who have really put a lot of time and effort into making that uh, corridor what it is right now and it's it definitely has a future so as I said I, I, I compliment you on recognizing that the uh, future is near here as far as this corridor goes great any, any other questions okay thank you we'll move this thank ahead. you okay uh, legislation to waive the RFP process uh, for a home headquarters for our use of ARPA, ARPA money and this is mr. Collins Good morning, Councilors. Michael Collins, Commissioner for Neighborhood and Business Development. So uh, we have uh, four items uh, in, a, in a row here that are related. Uh, the first one is the uh, uh, SHARP program, uh, where we're looking to put a million dollars into uh, home repair, emergency home repair. So the SHARP program allows us to make sure that we can partner with, uh, it's operated by home headquarters allows us to make sure that we can do uh, uh, emergency repairs in uh, low income owner occupied homes. Specifically, we're asking for a waiver because there is no other entity that's capable of delivering this and home headquarters has a long, very strong history of being highly successful with getting this money out to, to where it's needed. So this is a low, uh, low interest loan, 1%, and the AMI is 120%, so uh, they're smaller loans, right? Up to $25,000? So the uh, the SHARP program 
And you know, uh, Counselor, I may be going out of order from what you have in okay. front of you. Maybe. Um, are. So uh, the SHARP program is going to be uh, up to three thousand dollars. The urgent care is the loan that is um, okay. twenty-five thousand. Uh, twenty-five thousand, correct? Okay. So, but they're all in the same context as far as that goes. I'm sorry, Counselor. Yeah, I mean, they're all in the same general context. So they, they are. The uh, the other three, we've got the urgent care, which does the larger projects. Uh, so that's up to $25,000. It's uh, uh, basically a forgivable loan or up to half of it can be forgiven. There's the 1% loan uh, for home improvement that is up to $25,000. Uh, and that is for uh, families up to 120% AMI, which is a higher amount than we've been able to um, reach with a lot of the home improvement products for low, again, for uh, income qualified homeowners. And then the closing of cost assistance so that uh, uh, people that are working towards uh, becoming homeowners that are, again, income qualified, uh, they're able to have assistance to match their, their own hard earned savings that they've put aside so that they can become homeowners. Okay, any questions from any of my colleagues regarding this? Counselor, or President Kempton? Um, you said income qualified. So are the income requirements, because I know during the pandemic, a lot of the criteria changed to allow people to become part of these processes. Are the qualifications going to stay the same or are they going to be kind of reduced a little bit? So for the 1% loan, we're actually able to go up to 120% AMI. So we've been able to expand upwards with that, which is which has been great because uh, as we've talked about with uh, uh, the emergency rental assistance and, and some of the other programs, to your point, there's, there have been uh, groups that, that are, are deserving and in need and we haven't necessarily had a chance to get to. Uh, for the others, we've really looked at where the, uh, where the majority of the need is and, and where the requests have been coming from. And we've, because we can't put all $123 million just into sharp and urgent care, we've still had to have some restrictions on it. wonderful opportunity for us across the board. As you're aware, CDBG um, requirements are 80 and below AMI. We're expanding this to 100%, except for the 1% where we're going to 125. So it really is going to expand the eligibility to more people than what we traditionally have done. Councilor Green? Commissioner, are there administrative fees associated with this from home headquarters perspective and if so what are they uh so uh yes counselor there's going to be a 10 percent administrative fee uh which is uh, considering the amount of money that they'll uh need to not simply get out but be able to monitor we do want them to be staffed enough to make sure that they've got the the capacity to do that uh one of the things that i, I i've been super appreciative of uh li listening to all uh the, the counselor's concerns over the last few meetings around arpa is recognizing what our own internal capacity is within the city we have the ability to do that with our partners and so we we see that at home headquarters has been an exceptionally efficient agency uh when it when it comes to being able to administer this money we don't want to stretch anybody too thin when in the end we're also going to be held accountable for it as well yeah now just, just a simple question in terms of usage how has the the demand been in terms of people applying and, and, and people that actually get approved and actually get turned away, what's, what's that like? Is it, is it highly competitive or where we have small amount of money and yeah. just too many people? So, Councillor, with, with your that? permission, we'll, we'll allow Kerry uh, uh, Quag, the executive director, to the, the true expert in that, to be able to answer that question for you. Yes, Kerry Quagley, a CEO of Home Headquarters. And, um, you know, I realize that this is a waiver of competitive bidding, which maybe sounds a little bit unusual, but for 25 years, Home Headquarters has bid on these exact programs under the CBG program. We've been operating these programs for 25 years. For 25 years, every time you allocate dollars in each of these programs, they're spent almost immediately. We started the contract year with CDBG funding for virtually all of these programs on May 1st, that's the CDBG uh, calendar year, they're all gone. The sharp dollars are gone, the urgent care dollars are gone. The closing May 1st? In May 1st, till now, three months, it's gone. Are we confident we can get these uh, these funds out the door You know, within a year? Absolutely, and that's been our experience. Okay, that, that's great, and, and we, we know, you know, it's, we know we, we have, uh, you know, uh, 
a population within our city that struggles. Right. You know, and, and it, you know, they have all background of people. What's, what's, what's the diversity of the applicant that, 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 that take advantage of these services? Yeah, there is incredible diversity. We actually had a, um, a study done for a strategic plan that we were working on. Um, and um, frankly, we didn't even know this in-house, but um, if you are a black family who owns a home in the city of Syracuse, and you had any home improvement work done, there's a 90% chance you got that at home headquarters, that funding at home headquarters. And maybe it's not, it speaks to the, the fact that uh, unfortunately banks and credit unions don't always do the greatest job reaching out to minority households. Okay, my last question, Council. Okay. With the marketing, how, how do you do your marketing? Because I, I, I know <coughs> in my well, uh, I, I spoke to a neighbor, one of my neighbors uh, last year, and he uh -huh. access to maybe internet and other outlet to be able to be aware of those stuff so that they can take advantage of these services. Yeah, and it, we, we try to leave no stone unturned. Obviously, it's on our website, but you're right. Not everybody has internet access. Um, we also rely heavily on um, all the other nonprofit agencies. Probably we, we get the most referrals, believe it or not, from you folks. The common counselors re refer folks all the time. Uh, and organizations uh, such as Jubilee Homes, uh, NIDA, Syracuse United Neighbors are constantly referring people to us as well as neighborhood and business development because people call there looking for help as well. Thank you. One quick follow up on that. So Carrie, have you thought about maybe doing some of the black media or the media within the inner city core like The Stand or uh, Kenny Jackson? Have you thought yep. about maybe doing some of that type of? Uh... We, we do that routinely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, President Hudson. Michael, so why don't you just, why don't we just count these off? You had all these different pieces of legislation. I think we have my, council, my fellow counselors uh, asked all the questions, but why we get we start with the SHARP grant? So uh, starting with the SHARP grant, we have, and forgive me as I put on my glasses here, we've got $1 million in the SHARP grant. Okay, and then you have, the, we go next to the $3,000 for the uh, small homeowner. Well, so these so homeowner assistant repair program. So, the, so, the, the, so the, the Sharp Grant has a three thousand uh, dollar cap on okay. it. So there's a, so there's a million dollars total within the Sharp Grant. The okay. urgent care then has the four point five million, and that's where it's up to twenty five thousand dollars. Okay, and then we have the uh, small, the one percent interest loans. One percent interest loan. So that's that's going to be a maximum loan of twenty five thousand dollars as well, and we've, we're putting a million dollars into that program. And then we're we we go to the five hundred thousand dollars for the. Um, for the, for the closing of cost assistance, closing correct, cost and, and that, assistance. that would be $5,000. So, so together, what we've pr uh, put in front of all of you is uh, a sum of $7 million. And then we have the request for legislation to appropriate the $4,500,000 to, to, uh, for the home improvement partial loans. Correct? Uh, so, and that, that is- 50% loan deferred seven years residency requirement. And, and that yeah that's the that's the 4.5 million for um, uh, for the urgent care okay so these were all uh, uh, city clerk will these all be separate items these will all be separate items on the agenda okay and if we covered everything Michael uh, that's that's all that I have in front of you all yeah, yeah. any other questions I have one more for Please. Carrie so Carrie the threshold have risen it used to be um, five Michael just says seven years so the threshold has moved up for people to have to be able to get grants. they have to stay seven instead of five yeah well they vary the um with uh sharp and and uh that's three thousand dollars per it's a five-year requirement closing cost assistance is a five-year compl uh, compliance period as the dollar amount goes up the compliance period increases so typically for urgent care and home improvement it's seven years and Thank that's you. actually always been the case. Thank it's just you. for the smaller amounts, it's, it's, it's five years. And uh, Councilor Hogan, we submitted four different legislative asks because typically for each program, we will enter into a separate contract. I thought you did it because I'm chair and, and you wanted to confuse me even no. more than I usually do. <laughs> no. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so 
Hearing none, uh, do I have any other questions? Council Drisser, do you have any questions about this? Sorry. We're doing some great things here. So. Okay, I'll call all these items uh, I'm, uh, ready for the agenda, and uh, that's all I have here as far as economic development. So I'll turn it over to uh, Councilor Green Finance. I think you're next, aren't you? Yeah, is it DPW next? Is DPW the next one? Um, actually, it was it's NBD, but Councilor Allen is not here. Okay. I was uh, going to take Councilor Allen's items. Um, yes, it appears that they're all land make items, right? All properties. Michael, did anyone want to speak to? You could just get um, on the items. Oh, yeah, it's Michelle. Yeah, so, Custis, Michelle is okay. going to be able to speak to it. Can you just let us know um, the addresses in which district they're in, Michelle? Yep, so we have uh, 1412 West Colvin Street, uh, District 3. It was approximately uh, $119,000. Um, that's a vacant lot. Um, 120 Crippen Ave uh, is in District 3. Uh, it's a vacant residential structure. It owes approximately $3,400. Uh, 116-18 Kenwood Ave in District 2 owes approximately $6,000. It's a vacant residential structure. Uh, 201 South Midler, uh, also a vacant residential structure. District 5 owes approximately $21,000. Um, and then the last one is 813 and a half Tallman Street, uh, also a vacant structure in District 4 that owes approximately $11,000. Okay. Anybody have any questions, counselors? Okay. I believe you got this in email. Yes, yeah, I, I have the items in front of me. Okay, thanks, Michelle. That's all, Madam President. What's that? Standing committee, not at a meeting. Okay. <laughs> which one? Which one's next, Madam President? It's a DPW. 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 Okay. What's that? I'll take him. Yeah. yeah, sure. Okay. So, on behalf of Councilor Carney, we can start with the Mosley Drive pump station. That's is the commission is Commissioner Awald here yet? I'm here. Can I see my? Yeah, well, we can do some of yours, Commissioner. All right. Uh, Jeremy Robinson, uh, Commissioner of Public Works. Uh, the first one I got is the uh, the uh, extension for the JM, J, uh, JMT for the TMC room, Traffic Contro uh, Control Center, Traffic Management Center, sorry. It's the first of uh, three um, one-year extensions. Any questions on this one? Are the members of the DPW committee okay with it? I think it's just you, Councillor Majo. Are you okay with this item? Okay. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the next one I got is uh, requesting funds. I believe it's uh, to set up a capital project account for uh, for road reconstruction, as well as the uh, north, south, east, west interconnect project. Uh, this is going to be reimbursed by the state touring route program. So we're going to mill, mill and pave some more roads and get reimbursed. What's the uh, schedule on these? The schedule for milling and paving? Yep. Uh, we're going to try to complete, we got about, we identified about 34, 35 new roads that we can pave with the money. Uh, we're going to try to get as many as we can, weather permitting. So. I, I could say maybe 70, 75 percent probably be paved this year and rolled on to the the next calendar year into April, May, June. Great. Any questions on these items? This item? You're good, Councilor. Okay. And the last item I got is the uh, 
waiver for uh, traffic signal parts for our, our traffic uh, lights. Uh, this is supposed to have been on the waiver uh, that we submitted, the waivers that we submitted before, but this one just slipped through the cracks. It's proprietary. I know you hate that press, but uh, these guys make us buy our, the parts and services through them or avoids the warranty. So, Is it the same vendor for every traffic light or do we do, do we have different ones for? Oh, there's, there's this, it's uh, two, it's a uh, traffic, uh, it's Eastcom and um, Northeast Signal. Uh, so we use a few. So, and this is slightly off topic, but when we're talking about traffic signal optimization as related to BRT, how does that tie in? Are there, is there one model that that works with and one that it doesn't, or how does that all relate? Uh, I'm not quite sure, Counselor, but I can get back to you on that. Okay. Any other questions on this one? You're good, Counselor? I'm joking. Okay. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, I mean, the only other one on here was the uh, <clears throat> Mosley Drive pump station, which is the water department. So we did talk about this one at the ARPA meeting. Um, are you okay with this one, Counselor? Okay, so we'll move that one as well. So then all the DPW items would be ready to go. So then we'll roll into finance then. Oh, do you have you have the vehicles as well, right? I have, Rich. Yeah, I have the equipment. Rob okay. Rich Devesti, a fleet director. Yeah. Uh, these are purchases. Uh, we'll be using the chips money, so they'll be fully reimbursable from from the state. Uh, just dump trucks and just road road recon equipment and plows. <clears throat> What's a this is an ignorant question? Four by four truck. What do we use those for? It's the bigger. Well, the ten wheelers are just rear wheel drive. Four by fours. We do the smaller streets like SU and. Uh, and over on the west side too. The four by fours are just a little bit smaller. Dump truck, it gives us a little more uh, flexibility in the smaller streets with the street side parking. Um, overall, what's our breakdown in terms of plowing between the larger ones and the smaller ones? Well, the, the three, the larger ones will just be for the road recon and the smaller ones, uh, the four by fours will be, will be strictly plows. Okay. No, but it, as a general rule, uh, out of our snow plowing fleet, how many of the smaller? Oh, we like to keep six four by fours, and we got um, we got about fifteen ten wheelers that we use. Okay. And then we have a fleet of four F four fifties for the for the dead ends. Okay. So. Any other questions on this? Okay, we'll move that one. Is there other DPW ones that I'm missing? Okay, finance. So we can start with, who's here from finance? Matt. Okay, so we can start with the, correcting the tax rolls. Good morning, counselors. So we've got three of these. Um, 103 Slocum, turns out this is owned by the Housing Authority, should have been exempt to begin with, so we need to modify the role to reflect that. 219 Furman, I guess, had an erroneous board up cleanup charge. Same deal, need to um, change that. Then we've got a little misprint here on the tracker. Um, 205, 207, uh, Scottholm Terrace, not Slocum. And that's, um, that's the same deal. We had a board up cleanup, I think, that was erroneously applied. The taxpayer called that to our attention, so we'd like to uh, change the role to reflect that. Okay, any questions on these items? Councillor Hogan, it's just you and I from finance. Are you comfortable with it? I'm perfectly okay with that. Whatever <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Thanks Councillors. Okay. Uh, next, we'll go to the downtown special assessment. Um, do we, America, do, are you presenting it or is someone from? Is, <laughs> America Trier, downtown committee of Syracuse. Uh, this is uh, an execution of our annual operating agreement. So our budget uh, was reviewed and approved back in April and May. So this then is just the contract to allow us to draw down on those funds based on the budget presented. Is there any questions on this? No. I would just like to uh, commend you on 
bring it back to the Arts and Crafts Festival. It was a great event. I Thank you. had the opportunity to go down there. It was so, it felt normal again, you know, seeing the Arts and Crafts Festival. Thank you My very much. My friend Dave and Lori Reed down there too, so it was terrific. Yeah, appreciate your support. Um, it was definitely a great weekend and the community came out. Thank you. Any other questions? Are you good with this one, Councilor? Yes. Okay. Thank you, America. Yep. House Marshall Special Assessment. Morning, I'm Dave Mankwitz. I'm a board member of the Cross Marshall Business Improvement District. This is the parallel item for Cross Marshall as for the downtown committee. Um, so it's the annual contract. The, the contract amount will be $93,750, which is the amount that you approved back as part of the city budget in May. Most of our money goes for environmental maintenance and security, and then the insurance and the audit to support that. What does environmental maintenance mean? We have a person up there assigned every day to go through and clean the district. And so um, they sweep the place, pick up the trash, they, they shovel the snow off the sidewalks, they pull weeds, they do all that, they do that kind of work. Plus we do any repairs or replacements that might be needed in the district. So if you see a brick missing, if a tree dies, those types of things, those are all done in our maintenance program. Okay. Any questions on this? Councilor, you ready? You're perfectly okay with this. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thanks, David. Okay. Next, we're going to go into, I think this one's Budget Director Rudd. The bond refunding. Okay. Good morning, Councilors. Brad O'Connor, uh, Commissioner of Finance. So I've got two items. The first one here is the refunding of our 2012 and 2013 A bonds. This is more commonly called a refinance. Uh, the way our bonds are structured, we're locked into the terms of the bond for a certain number of years. After those years, they become eligible to be refinanced. The rates that we got in 2012 and 2013 were much higher than the rates we can get today. So we are proposing to refund these two bonds. Uh, total uh, refund is two, uh, $20,200,000. Uh, based on the estimated interest rates, we won't know the actual interest, interest rates until we pass legislation and uh, lock in on a refunding, but the estimated interest rates that we can get today, uh, this will save the city about $1.8 million uh, through 2033, which is the maturity date of the refunded bonds. Does this extend the term at all, or is it still the same? Uh, it does not extend the term, no. Just, uh, just changes the interest rate, essentially. So this is a continuing process, right, Brad? To look for something like this, right? Uh, right, and our, our um, uh, fiscal advisor uh, will bring these up to us. So he, he's monitoring when these become eligible to be refunded, and and will put us on a schedule. Uh, it's not every year, but you know, at least every other year, one will come up that we can refund. And in in today's interest rate environment, uh, usually it's beneficial to refund these. Excellent. Is there some sort of fee associated with that? I'm just picturing from someone that purchased the bonds why you would allow this to be something the city can do. Well, when, when they purchase the bonds, they know that they're locked in for the eight years. So, you know, part of how they price the bond is taking into consideration the fact that these could be refunded in the future. So when we're purchasing new bonds, I mean, are there, are there different options that some are fixed rate and some are potential fundable or... How does that work? Uh, they're all fixed rate, okay. um, but they will be fixed for a certain term. And so, you know, the, the investors that buy these bonds will factor that into their calculations. And, and so essentially the value they give it um, takes into consideration the eight year lock and the potential to refinance after that. So they're not, they're not valuing the rate that they offer on these uh, for the entire term of the bond because they're not locked in for the entire term of the bond. Are there other bonds that we could potentially do this with that we're exploring or is this? A uh, not right now. These, these are the two that uh, become eligible this month. Um, there will be more in the future. We have, um, you know, I'd say uh, 12 outstanding that will uh, become refundable over the next 10 or so years. 
Okay. What's the eligibility predicated on? What, what limit, time limit usually? Is? Uh, it's included in the initial okay. bond document. It'll, so it it'll, varies. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions on this? Rogan, are you comfortable with this one? I'm okay with this too. Thank you. Good job. Thanks, Brad. I appreciate it. Thank sure. you. Um, second item I have here before you is a uh, request for authorization for an inner fund loan. Uh, this is a $7 million loan from the general fund to the capital fund uh, in accordance with New York State General Municipal Law Section 9A. Uh, this loan would cover advanced spending on um, capital projects that primarily capital projects that are going to be reimbursed by New York State or uh, the federal government. The projects that Commissioner Robinson and Mr. DeVesti just spoke about are examples of the types of things that are going to be covered here. We have to outlay the funds and we're later reimbursed by New York State. That, that reimbursement can come up to five months after uh, we outlay the funds. Um, the loan under the general municipal law, this loan uh, will need to be repaid with interest. The interest rate is the interest we're earning on our uh, bank account from the fund that it's being transferred from. So um, currently we're, we're earning about 2% or point, sorry, 0.2% interest um, on our savings. Um, if we repaid that in December, uh, it would be about $10,000 of interest. So this, this is something that is unusual for the city. Uh, in the past, we've used cash that we had in the capital fund. There's a couple of things that have changed recently that are necessitating this loan. Uh, in last year, if you remember, in the 2021 budget, we moved $3.5 million from the capital fund back into the general fund to balance the budget. So those are the funds that in the past we would have used to advance for these reimbursable type grants. Uh, another thing coming into play, um, DOT reimbursed projects, New York State DOT reimbursed projects are typically in the four to $5 million range. Uh, this year, uh, fiscal year 22, we're getting over $12 million. So a lot easier to manage the advanced spending on $5 million than it is $12 million. Uh, the other difference we have here, this, this general municipal law went into effect in 2019. Before that, we had the authority to move these funds from fund to fund as we wanted. We're now locked in uh, to the requirements of this general municipal law, which uh, state that we now need uh, council approval to make these loans. This, for ARPA as well, for ARPA projects, do we use that out of capital? We won't use it for ARPA projects. Um, ARPA, we, we get the funds in advance, so we will be spending the cash we have on hand. The, the ARPA money is not available to loan in here, you know, they're, because of the restrictions on the ARPA money, so this has to come from the general fund. So as it stands now, what is in our capital fund and what's in our general fund? Um, I'll have to get back to you. Capital fund, we have about five and a half million dollars. Uh, general fund, I'll have to get back to you on that. But enough that we're comfortable giving away seven. Yeah, we, we, we have considerably more than the uh, $40 million we projected in the 2021 budget. We projected to have at the end of 2021. Other questions on this? Along the same lines, I was wondering if at some point uh, in the future capital projects, if we could uh, get something from the administration of what they propose to spend, use ARPA money and what they would use for cap capital money. I know there, there are certain limits because of census tracts and all that stuff, mm -hmm. but I, I'd be, I would like to see the strategy, basically. And that's, you know, I don't know if that's something you and Tim could work on with, with us, too. Yeah, I, I mean, can, this I, is what we're talking about is essentially right now is a, a bridge loan, basically, until the state money comes in, right? Right, it is, and you know, um, it's similar to a uh, revenue anticipation note, okay. which we've, we've used in the past, but it's a revenue anticipation note from fund to fund rather than from an external party. Okay, Red, can we retroactively use capital funds for a project that's already be? been started and the context here would be if we were to use ARPA funds for something it turns out it's not eligible can it then switch over to be used for capital funding we can 
Um, you know, there there are some steps we'd have to take, but yes. Okay. Well, suppose if the infrastructure bill comes through, we're, we've got a project underway and we're using ARPA money, could we do the same thing, or we we don't probably know, that, right? Um, you know, if if we've already claimed that money and we've got a file. Uh, um, I believe quarterly with the treasury. Uh, if we've already claimed that money, we can't then reallocate it, I don't believe. But um, if we have planned for that, that project as ARPA dollars and infrastructure money or other money comes in, we can, we can uh, reallocate that. Okay. Uh, my understanding also, this could be wrong. Uh, I've been wrong before, believe it or not. ARPA, ARPA money, we can bank and collect interest on it, correct? Yes, we can. Wow, it's amazing. Okay, so it, can, it will be allocated a share of the hundreds of hundreds of dollars we're getting each month. This is a general question, Brad. Now, with ARPA money uh, versus our capital planning and capital spending, how much of that could we calculate? How much of our capital uh, funding? And Spending is eligible to eligible for us to use us first, and then we we calculate it. Um, I don't know that we have. Um, <coughs> not not specifically addressing each project. Okay. I, I would love to see that. Just, mm. just see you know currently the target that we have. Yeah, we can we can put that together. We'll take a look at our uh, capital plan for 22 and see if any of them qualify for ARPA dollars. Any other questions? Are you comfortable with this one, Councilor Hogan? Yes, absolutely. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next one is a waiver of competitive bid for Salt City Abstract Independent Title Agency. Matt, is this one you as well? Oh, law, okay. Tim, do you want to talk about it then if no one else from law is here? Budget Director Rudd. Yes, yes, get Budget Director Rudd up here. There we go. <coughs> I think somebody from law is going to come, but I could do the IT one if you want to do that one because Dave's sure. on vacation. Sure, why don't you start there? Um, so there's a... There's, we're entering into a contract with uh, five IT service providers, and uh, <coughs> IT basically budgets two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year to use outside consultants. So we now the MWBE hiring requirements um, apply to professional services as of twenty nineteen. So. Traditionally, what would happen is the primary vendors have to make a plan to sub, if they're going to get more than $50,000, they have to make a plan to sub 20%. And that part has seemed um, somewhat burdensome and somewhat ineffective from my perspective. So we're slightly changing the approach. So um, Lamont Mitchell and I have jointly uh, basically said, and law has said we have the ability to do this because we're basically making an alternative path to compliance for the MWBE stuff that's in line with the council's law. So instead of requiring, because we're not really sure how much of the work will go to which of the five companies. So, and then they all kind of have different skill sets. So it becomes really clumsy for them to need to be the subbing out when they're already sort of like consultants for the city. So we're assigning compliance to the department level. So essentially, the director of IT, Dave, will have to, he's the one who's going to have to give 20% directly to MWBE firms, 12% minority, 8% women. So long story short, 
we're authorizing their spending, but we're sort of holding back 50,000 worth of it, such that until Dave gives us the full work plan for how he's going to use the MWBE firm. So of these five, one is woman owned, but we're gonna continue with inter interviews for the minority owned. And then when he has a proper plan, he's going to submit a plan for fifty per, for fifty thousand dollars worth of the two hundred fifty thousand budget to those firms, and at that point, will increase his authority for this contract by another fifty thousand. But this lets him get started, so he's not got a um, a gap where he can't have people working. Any questions on that? I don't have a question. I have a comment. I just want to make a comment. I want to thank you as administration because as we sit in these um, RFPs and we talk about a city being being diverse and equity and all this good stuff, when we talk about it and then we have these RFP meetings and you hear, oh, I can't. No, that's not acceptable. So I applaud you for taking that step to move forward to ensure that we're going to be equitable throughout the city. So thank you. And thank you, President Hudson. Keep pushing, keep holding us accountable. It makes it easier to do things different when people are advocating for it to be done different. And, and you said when it started, it started in What, the MWBE rules changed in 2019. Well, it's a multi-year award usually, so I think this is the first time it's come through since the law changed. Um, so that's part of it, but. We didn't change the law. We're changing the approach to complying with the law because we haven't seen compliance, compliance in the way that we want. And part of the reason is because I've, and Lamont can speak to this too if he wishes, but a lot of it's based on the intent to comply. Okay. So a lot of the compliance is, will you comply? Will you plan for this? And people can say yes. And then they can also say, we intend to, we make good faith effort, but we didn't find and then there's not really a penalty for not complying in the end. So um, this is an, it seems more easy to hold the department head to account for that. So in this case, where he's bringing on multiple vendors for a fair amount of money, it seems a reasonable approach to just force him to hire multiple firms and to do the minimum amount of work and then to essentially not require the primary contractors to sub anything out because he's directly choosing which work goes to those firms and I think that's a good thing in the long run because it builds relationships with the city between the city and minority and women-owned firms such that they're in a better position to compete in the long run because I do think one of the barriers to a lot of the things we procure are that we become comfortable with the people who are currently running the contract so this forces you to have relationships with multiple. So in theory, you're comfortable with more people, so they have a better chance of getting the work in the longer run. At least that's the way I see it. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to ask is how bad was it before we start with zero wind on this now? How bad was it in terms of, of, of In terms of not meeting the 20%? Right. I don't know, because we don't really look at it, because that's not the way the law is written is written around the attempt so we would look at their plan but I think it's pretty safe to say it was pretty low there has to be some data that showed that the initial work didn't really support what 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 we want you know and that's what I if we could see the percent if that if that 20 percent was the requirement how 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 bad did we do in meeting that 20 percent that's that's the question i'm trying to ask 
I could only say pretty bad. I would say that we work primarily with two companies. One of the companies on their EEO forms had 64 employees and not a single person of color. So I think the numbers are not great depending on the, especially probably in IT, but there are, I think eight minority owned companies that applied for this work. And we brought one woman owned on already in this group of five. So, I mean, part of it is that they're not local to start. So, but I think at some point then they, so these companies are gonna have to come in and register in Syracuse and do all this stuff, but that's just what we're gonna have to do to kind of form a culture of compliance. So it's, it's still not perfect, but it will actually give $50,000 of work and there's kind of like the workforce targets for the companies and then there's the subbing out con requirements. So I would say the numbers, you don't probably need the analysis to have President Hudson's feelings validated. It's bad. You said it right. It's bad. And it's not just IT. So we're not just going to just beat up on IT. It's all the departments and we need to do a better job. If we're going to talk about, again, diversity and equity, we need to be doing it across the board. So. Yeah. I mean, I completely support that. I think, I think you know, if we are, this, if we are the city that, that carry flag saying that we are diverse and we aim for diversity, I think, I think we should live what we say, right? So that's, I get that. Now, what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to get at is, is that if we are to go out and, and beat up ourselves and say, you know, we need more diversity, we got to show how bad we are and where we want to go. And there's no better way to, to show that than, than to produce numbers and say, you know what, here's our numbers. Maybe, maybe, maybe with, you know, assumption and, and, and reality are different. And that's what I'm trying to get at if we are to reevaluate how we do business. It's important that those know it's, it's, it's Let me just add that um, the um, legislation that you just moved forward for that software is part is going to be a big solution to this because right now you have Lamont and it was me before Lamont <laughs> and then you had we just added a position to Lamont. All of this is paper right now. And so what B2G now does, it also requires, and we'll add this to contracts, that they have to um, register themselves in that software and give us real-time data in the software. Mm -hmm. So the software that you just moved forward is gonna be a big um, help for us on the, manage, on the uh, accountability and the monitoring side of it. Okay. Comfortable with this one, Councilor? Uh, yes, thanks for your efforts, sir, Jim. Thank you. Um, to the extent you have questions about the actual use of the contractors, I think Dave will be here at the next meeting. Okay. All right, next one, Salt City Abstract Law Department. Good afternoon, Councilors. Joe Barry, First Assistant. Uh, these are our annual waivers to procure the services of the uh, abstract companies, which we mainly use to process the land bank acquisitions the, you know, the, in order to uh, acquire the properties and do the title work so that we can then transfer them to the land bank. It's uh, specialized work in that these companies uh, have expertise in that matter and we want to keep the process going to uh, make sure the land bank properties flow on a regular basis any questions on this if there's any way we can speed the process up joe we'll depend on you because <laughs> well, uh, we'll, we'll take all we can get this land bank so what can you do about that so. <laughs> <laughs> well there was a state moratorium on seizing prop certain properties so that was part of the delay with the COVID, but. We'll get up to speed soon, Joe. We're, we're doing the best we can to okay. keep those moving. Thank you. Are you comfortable, Councilor? Yes. Okay, thank you, Joe. Welcome. All right, the next one is on behalf of the Bureau of Research. It's about. Yeah. 
Good morning, Janet Burke, the Director of Bureau of Research. Um, so we are here for, for a two-pronged approach. We are asking for a waiver of competitive bid in order to enter into an agreement with Sarah Stevens, who is SS Procurement and can't remember what the other word is. And Sarah is incredible experience in writing grants and managing grants. And I am down to one person that I have had in the department for six weeks. <coughs> so we are hoping to leverage the, some ARPA administration money in order to be able to cover the amount that we're asking for of 18,000 to enter into an agreement with Sarah. What about your three people for ARPA? How's, how's I actually believe I have found one. Actually, it was two people. Um, I have a third. Oh, posi a three. I have a position open in my department, but it's not an ARPA-related position. And I have two program manager positions that so we're looking position to you fill. Have open is the one that is lacking. And that's why we're hiring Sarah. That's correct. Okay. Yes. So you and I think I, be I believe I have found one project manager but it hasn't been completed yet we're having okay. some questions back and forth okay is the idea this would be just for the year or would we keep her on after well that? i'm certainly hoping that when we get someone in full-time in the position of the management analyst that that person would be able to take this over you know right now i'm concerned that um we want to have all eyes out for whatever funding possibilities are out there and Right now, we just don't we just don't have that capacity. And I and, she, and Sarah knows where to look, and she knows how to write them. She has all you know the experience with every grant that we write. So this would be like for six months, and then we evaluate how it's going. Correct. Well, we, come back right, to us. right. It'll probably be until until she's uses up the amount that we have there, which I believe we we based on two hundred hours. Other questions on this? Are you comfortable with it, Councillor Hogan? No. Let's do it. Okay. Thank you. Sounds good. Thanks, Janet. And I believe that's all we have for finance, unless I'm missing anything. So that's it. Madam Jimmy, President. Right. Councillor Hogan, you're up. Oh, I should have been before. Somebody jumped in, in front of me. Yeah. Uh, but you're up now. <laughs> that's because you took so many okay. items. Okay. So, Parks Department. Commissioner. Easy. Good afternoon, Julia Fave, Commissioner Parks and Rec. Hello, Commissioner. Hi. Uh, first one, I'm requesting authorization to um, allocate capital funds bonded 300000 for upcoming Eastwood engagement. So the funds, I don't have the project specifically picked out yet, but it's to be used solely within the Eastwood Parks to be determined by massive public engagement that we're going to, to conduct starting next month. I don't know. No. I'm not. <laughs> What do you think about this, Councillor Driscoll? I'm a big fan, Councillor Hogan. And unfortunately, Eastwood is not part of the census track, so we're going to use our own money, right? Um, there's small port. Well, so we already have. You guys already previously allocated 150 for a, a playground in Norwood. We're working through potential programming to be in Eastwood. Then there's this, but correct, most of Eastwood is not in the ARPA, so that's why okay. we're going for this. Good. Let's go ahead. Anything for the parks department? Okay. Um, and since I have Jimmy Mato here, I'm going to skip, if you don't mind, for the donations for TNT and the Reesman Foundation. So there is a community member who has gotten grants for, sorry, I think it's item number 29 and 30. I can't, see, or 30 and 31, I can't see their half. But basically to accept funds from TNT in the amount not to exceed 75000 it'll be slightly less than that. And then another amount from the recent foundation. This is to install a spray feature, which has already been designed by um, the company that we already contract with that does our playgrounds. The city will be putting in a little bit from capital funds that I already have. And again, to install a spray fountain in Washington Square Park. Oh, so, and I'm sorry, it does say 67500 So what's the total cost for the spray? The total cost is, a, um, I think it's 115 give or take. I can get you the total oh, breakdown if you'd like. Yeah, but whenever. the city contribution is going to be around 30000 and so we're getting donations for how much? 67500 from TNT. Okay. 15000 from the Reisman Foundation. And then the city, through my capital accounts, is covering the rest. Is this Maureen, Jimmy? Maureen? Yes. Yeah, terrific woman. God bless her. Every neighborhood she ever. Uh, something like that. So this is terrific. Okay. 
Okay, and then while we're in Washington Square Park, the next one is just to receive a donation of a donation of a twelve foot bike rack from Walmart to be installed. It's from Mr. Meyer, I believe. It is, yes. yes. Well, of course. Good for her. good. Okay. Any questions on any of that? I just have a quick one. Yes. The bike racks that we use with got you. They're still up in areas. Are we going to leave those up? So I think that would be a different department. That might be a, um, is that an Eric Ennis question? That's actually not by, they're in parks in addition to other locations, but I think the city is working on. Or are you going to leave them go. for that? Yeah, Eric can take it. Glad I stuck around. Uh, good, uh, good morning, counselors, whatever time of day it is. So the city, uh, it, we are executing a new agreement with a new operator for our bike share system. Instead of formerly Gotcha, uh, this company is known as Veo Ride. Uh, so what they're gonna be doing is we're working with them on the locations of the hubs. They're gonna be implementing the existing infrastructure that you do see right now that aren't being utilized. A lot of those hubs will remain in place, uh, but we're gonna have more bikes available. Scooters will be coming to the community as well. Um, so that infrastructure, we can actually change the branding. We'll be able to just change it from Gotcha to Veo, but it's still all going to be a part of the Sync bike share system. So as you're seeing them right now, they're not being utilized. The whole plan, and, the, and this will be implemented in 2021, all, um, all those hubs will be able to be recycled as a part of the new program. And when will that happen? Sure. So I know I believe we have not officially the parties have not executed the contract agreement yet, but I know both sides have been reviewing it. We've been working with the law department, and uh, implementation of the system is planned for this year. Um, so I, I fall is is what we're expecting. Okay. Do I have tires on them. Say that again. Gonna have snow tires on them. You know, it, well, it is intended to be a year-round system, so um, they are. It's a very durable bike, and uh, we're promoting all mo modes of transportation year-round. So. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, Eric. Okay, Commissioner, where 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 would we leave off? Tree um, lighting. Yes, the tree lighting. So I'd like to authorize the execution of the final year of the contract for the sound and spotlight for the production of the tree lighting, with the hopes and anticipations that it'll be a live event again. Yeah. Right. Okay. Any, any questions on this? Okay. Uh, I don't. The next item is to okay amend with this, Councilor Driscoll. Okay with it. I, I didn't go through the official. Is no, that's all right. I'm, and all that? I'm with it. I'm okay. with it on all of them. I okay. think you're it's a two zero vote right there. Okay. Um, item number twenty eight. Would like to amend a previous ordinance. The years were just mistakenly put in the ordinance that it was that's attached to the letter. The letter was correct. So this is just to correct it so that we can actually um, start to use the park road sidewalk paving funds. Okay. Let's see where we got there. Okay. And by fine. the way, very good. <coughs> uh, go on. And, and that means so the park road. Now, will we get a list of what park road? Park roads and sidewalks. Uh, I have the original ordinance here. The locations weren't changing. Oh, they're not changing. Okay. I don't see right. the original. Well, get that list to us if you could. Uh, okay. And the final item, which is 31, accept a donation. This is for a historical trail market trail marker. Um, designating where the Lafayette Trail was, where Lafayette actually um, visited. So it will be installed and maintained by the city, but this is just to accept the donation of the actual marker. I think City Auditor Maroon welcomed General Lafayette when he was here on, on that occasion, right? <laughs> Perfect. Any question, Council Driscoll? Those yeah. are all my items. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, parks is done, President Hudson. All righty, Councilor Majok. Thank you, Madam President. Yes. I don't have I don't have that on here. So okay, I guess we'll go to education. Do you want me? Do you want me to do it? Um, so we just have a one item, and this is to authorize the city clerk's office to enter into a memorandum of understanding with the Syracuse City School District and the Common Council. Um, to it's relative to operations of the Youth Advisory Council. Uh, it is a two thousand um, dollar amount to appro that would appropriate funds to the professional services of uh, the teacher that provided the, the support for the students throughout the um, the council year, youth council year. Um, if is if everybody's okay with that, then we should be okay. All right, moving on. Oh, Councilor Majel. 
Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, uh, so <laughs> Come on down. You're the next contestant. President Hudson, I have to, I didn't ask, see, Councilor Peggy Adler, and you're here, and I can't see her. She's part of my committee, and I never asked you, you okay with all the parks items? I was. But Thank I you for asking. This is a bad eye, too, so. <laughs> Gotta get a mirror set up for you, home. I, you know what? So I need a lot of help, Councilor. <laughs> you're doing fine, Councilor. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Chief. Um, I think you have three items? Uh, yes, I have three okay. items. All right, just, just start. Go ahead. Okay. Um, the first item um, is to accept funds from the Onondaga County for rescue equipment and training uh, to set up an account for reimbursed expenses. Um, and this is for equipment and overtime to send our firefighters to rope rescue training. And that's for an amount of $75,000. So the county reimburses us because we respond to the county and we are the technical rescue team for the county. Reimbursement 100%? Is that 100%? Yes, it's 100%. Okay. All right. Council Driscoll, question? That's good. The next is the ARPA funds. I was going to put that the to the last one because it's a little uh, lengthier than the last one. Um, yeah. And the third one that's on the agenda for me was uh, to reach an agreement with SUNY Upstate uh, for the purpose of conducting reality-based training at the Harrison House. It's located at 80 Presidential Plaza. Um, there's no cost to the city, but the city does bear liability if anything happens to the building or the firefighters there. Um, so. Uh, we use that facility just to do uh, reality-based uh, fire scenario training without live fire. Would that be the same case if we were to use our own building as well? Uh, yes, we would be able to uh, use our new tower if, when that gets approved. Um, I would imagine um, Harrison House at some point is going to be developed and occupied at some point. It's been vacant for several years now. so. Yeah. I, I don't believe it'll be available pretty soon. So the length of the length of this agreement um, is to not to exceed February of 2024. So. Our insurance is transferable with our people, right? Um, yes. This uh, this agreement all already went through Corporation Council, and they looked at it, and um, they gave me the okay to um, go into the agreement. Okay. okay. Right. Question. You good? Okay. Right. I'll get my paperwork. Is this the game plan, Chief? This is the game plan. I thought she was handing out cash. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. That's it for you, right, Chief? The 2000 one or this one's here? Go ahead. Come on. Um, so basically, I'm requesting um, to um, have uh, ARPA funding um, appropriated to the Department of Fire. Um, the packet that I gave you um, is just a bullet point of all the information of the facts of uh, the details of the need and the benefit for the firefighters and the citizens that we protect. Um, and I was going to just go over, I have an outline of um, the request that I have on behalf of our department, our firefighters and the citizens. Um, we're hoping to get this $2 million to upgrade the Syracuse Fire Department Regional Training Facility located at 312 State Boulevard. And these funds would be used to build a state-of-the-art training facility. Um, there has been no financial investment in the Syracuse Fire Department training facility in approximately 25 years. More specifically, our current five-story training tower was built in the early 1940s, making it nearly over 80 years old. Uh, due to 
not only structural deterioration, but it also we have changes in live fire training regulations. It is no longer safer to be used by firefighters for live training. So nothing can prepare um, our fire department for firefighting activities better than training in real life scenarios. Uh, the proposed tower is meant to simulate fires in not only high rise and mid rise buildings, but we will also be able to simulate operations um, in buildings that have been converted into loft style apartments over the last uh, few years in the city. Um, in these types of buildings, the work that the firefighters have to do is very labor intensive and very dangerous. Um, they have to drag their hoses, hook up the pre piped waterways inside the stairwells that could be smoky, and proceed upstairs to locate the fire and extinguish the fire. A stimulus investment in our training facility would be utilized to provide exactly this type of essential training that we are certainly and currently unable to provide for our Syracuse firefighters. And even like a building like we're in today, um, City Hall or City Hall Commons that um, many of you probably have been in. You know, we go to apartment buildings like that all the time and the first time the firefighters have to experience a live fire with heat, smoke, victims trapped is when <coughs> the 911 call comes. So this training facility will give us the, the opportunity to train our firefighters the way that I believe that they should be trained to protect our city. Um, so this facility will uh, meet all um, national um, standards with live fire burning in the facilities um, and it'll just continue the success that we want and I think that our city is accustomed to to protect the property and lives and to make it, mitigate all the dangerous hazards that are in the city of our size. So I can go down these bullet points if you like or if you got any questions you can just ask me. Um, I highlighted in red the statistics of data of the responses that we've had to structure fires on buildings that were on fire where the fire reached an upper level of the house. And when you see those statistics, I think the request um, for the training facility kind of speaks for itself. Um, we're hurting people, civilians are um, succumbing to their injuries and we're having fatal fires in these types of buildings that currently uh, we don't have the facility to train our firefighters. So um, <coughs> if you have any questions uh, with the highlighted information or the bullet points, um, just let me know. Um, I will say that I think not only ARPA money, but a lot of information comes before you. And I think this project will benefit every census tract in the city. There's buildings on all sides of towns. There are people that we respond to on all sides of towns others of our city. So I think this is an equitable um, uh, use to spend the money that it will benefit everybody and it will keep our firefighters safe. So I can go into the process, I can go into the money, um, anything else you'd like. Oh, this, this is good. Uh, if anything, we can do to improve and enhance the training, the process of our firefighters, this is a good thing for me. How much use would something like this get, Chief? So we would use it all the time. Um, our on-duty firefighters would use it all the time. Um, it's some of the things that we identified a few years ago. We wanted to do more hands-on training. And then when you look at statistics like um, I provided you, um, we have no choice but to do. Um, we train a lot. I think this past year we trained close to 30,000 hours. Um, the goal is to use it constantly. And when there's opportunities for other people to actually use a facility, um, we would certainly um, welcome them. Um, as you can see, I have a list of about a dozen other agencies that currently use a facility. Um, but one big thing that I'd like to note is the New York State Association of Fire Chiefs, which I'm a member of. Um, they do a fire conference every year uh, for several years before 2019. Uh, that, that, that conference was held out down in the Turning Stone. A few years it was held up in Lake George. So they came to Syracuse. 2019, um, we had a conference. They had vendors and apparatus down at the War Memorial, but over 200 firefighters did hands-on training over at our facility. 2019, there were 15,000 visitors that came to that conference. Um, it generated $10 million of economic impact for the city. Um, this year, we just had the conference a few weeks ago. Um, we had close to 200 firefighters utilizing our facility over at the training division um, per visit Syracuse, um, the training that we had this few weeks ago and the conference, even with COVID and all the restrictions, 
um, per uh, visit Syracuse that generated $6 million in economic impact. So I believe the request, there's money to come in to support the request um, that I'm asking for. It's for reno renovation. You, you're not going to build anything from ground up. Yes, it's, this is going to be a brand new uh, from the ground from up zero facility. up, like yep, right from the grass right now, straight up. Mm. So okay. um, the process um, after council authorization, uh, CNS uh, will begin engineering oversight. Um, then we we would be able to purchase a free uh, fabricated material that's built of steel off of a state contract. Um, then we would get. Um, drawings for the foundation um, that CNS is going to organize. Uh, then the foundation and site work will get bid out through an RFP process. And then also the construction and erection of the tower will get bid out. And all local companies will have the opportunity to bid on those. Um, $2 million is, is what you project of, of, of it as, as the budget for Yes, and I have that broken down. So $840,000 will be for the uh, prefabricated building. Um, CNS Engineering for their oversight will be $108,000. Uh, the foundation um, for fiscal year 22 will be $100,000. Going into fiscal year 23 will be an additional $200,000. And the tower construction, which is going to be the erection and putting the tower together once it's delivered, um, that's going to be $448,000. Um, and, and, and also, Chief, and this, this, this stepping away for a second, you know, I, I know some time when we get to the technical process like this is start to eliminate certain applicants, right? Yes. What's, what's the MWB in stuff like this? Well, we're going to go uh, and utilize all the city, uh, the city requirements for MWBE. Um, I'm not sure if any of uh, those particular um, companies will be able to bid on this because um, it is a specialized um, skill that you have to have to put this tower up because there are standards that has to meet uh, NF NFPA 1402. It has to meet certain standards. Can I just say because we're going to bid the project out, we don't want to get into the details of the project right now because anyone bidding would know exactly what we're looking for instead of giving us the, but the, <laughs> the procurement process will follow the processes that um, um, Budget Director Rudd gave us. Now, now with that, Chief, um, you said there are other um, local agencies that, that, that will be using the, 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 the facility, right? Um, yes. Now, now you, you said that there, was, that there is an economical in, impact for the area. Now, is there any direct uh, economical impact to the city in terms of uh, fees payment? You know, do they pay any fees to use our facility or is that just... We donated. Yes. Um, I just want to make this point. Um, the top priority of getting this facility is to make sure our firefighters are safe and doing their job mm -hmm. and to protect the people in the city. Um, the second priority, I would say, would be to come up with a fee schedule, which I already have a draft of one, and to utilize that and, based on the schedule of availability, let other outside agencies utilize our facility. Um, I've been talking with DeWitt Fire and Fayetteville Fire Department. They're the two closely most aligned fire departments that the city has because they have professional career fire departments. Um, and we talked about um, how much we would save from not having to go places we go to spend money to actually do some training and the money that they actually spend every year. And this was done early last year. Uh, we uh, estimated that between the three of our agencies, um, if our agency was utilized, we would save $117,000 per year. So over 15 years, that equals $1.75 million. Over 25 years, that would be a savings of $2.9 million. So once we put the fee Chief, schedule that's for out, us or for all of them combined? I would say it would be, it would definitely be a savings for us, but <coughs> the money that they're spending on travel, um, the equipment that they're using to take up to, um, just recently, uh, Fayetteville Fire Department traveled all the way up to um, Oswego, I believe it's 65 miles to Oswego, to do some of the training that uh, we will be able to do over here. This facility will be, this will be the best uh, training tower pretty much in the state once we get this erected. So, um, and next year, the state fire chief show is uh, coming back next year. We're in, pro in the process of trying to extend that contract. So I, I think we can expect at least another $6 million in impact. 
so this is this is something that we 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 are going to embark on and start figuring out in terms of fees mm -hmm. but we don't do it now with, with the facility that we have. so so right now we uh train with our partners you know, mutual aid uh people that um our hazardous materials team uh we respond to a three county um, area to respond to hazardous materials. Yeah. Um, Oswego Fire Department, they have a hazardous materials team not as large as ours or not as equipped as ours. Uh, so they would come down and um, they train with us frequently. Um, OCC, um, they also come and utilize our facility. Um, in return, they provide um, education for us that we're working on an agreement right now. So um, there's professional development um, in our department that uh, we started, we're going to start our, like the first ever professional development program this year, and it's going to be an, a program that's going to be equitable from the newest firefighter to the senior firefighter. So OCC has a fire protection technology program, mm -hmm. and um, to utilize our facility, they would also, they, we, we'd like barter them, so uh, our students, bad, yeah, they'd waive our tuition right. and things like okay. that, okay. and that would all go through Corporation Council and get approval. Okay. Um, one thing. I would have been mad at myself if I didn't bring this up <laughs> because there's a lot of things we've been working on um, that I think are really great um, and, and I have a bullet point um, PSLA at Fowler this fall will be the first year um, it'll be one of the first programs in the state where um, the students in this program they are going to enter the program in eighth grade they'll go all the way till 12th grade when they're in 11th and 12th grade um, they're going to start what they call firefighter one it's a um, certificate that we give our firefighters when they come into our recruit school we're going to give these uh, children all the curriculum in 11th and 12th grade and then underneath um, the direction of the fire chief um, our deputy chief uh, James Farrell and John Kane are sitting back there but he's a municipal training officer for the city of Syracuse uh, we're going to be able to give those students who pass um, New York State cert, uh, certifications and they're going to be nationally accredited so it's going to give them a head start if they score high on the civil service test if they get hired they're going to kind of know what's going on when training starts so um, they're going to be overusing this facility also so there's a lot of economic impact for those families um, if they can continue on and get into the fire service like I was able to do any other questions yeah so sorry okay the so the tower we have now we're not able it's just abandoned we're not able to use it at all can you say the, um, the we can do like um, cardiovascular things like you know we'll have firefighters put on their scba and their 80 pounds of equipment and walk up but they can't uh, we can't light any fires in there if you look at the picture um on the um pamphlet i gave you um that was one of the first years to simulate a live fire in a fifth floor building. It's like if this room was on fire, if this was converted into apartment buildings and um, this room was actually two apartments, which this is what is going on in the city right now. To have the firefighters pull up out on Washington Street and have to drag hoses up here to the second and third floor and find the fire, um, that second picture is kind of like what we would like to simulate, them going to a higher level of a building looking for the fire and extinguishing it and searching for victims and all those types of things that we have to do so right now we cannot do that at all and and i listened to your um you know we chatted i, I went back and i watched the youtube video and i think one of the questions you were asking is what are the alternatives the alternatives are we're going to either pay overtime like dewitt or fateville and go to oswego or somewhere outside the city but they would have to be off duty we'd have to you know get a fleet of vehicles that you know caravan our folks to get trained and the worst part if we don't do anything those statistics are pretty alarming that I have highlighted in the red they're just going to get worse if we can't practice and that's my top priority as a fire chief is to identify things that I think are the issue and you know just let people know so I'm not living with that by myself I think I think this tower will benefit everybody and if it isn't built um, kind of to your question um, to the deputy mayor during the finance committee we're just going in the wrong direction in my opinion so do we have a cost estimate though of what it would take to renovate the existing tower to make it operable for this um so what we do know is um, we have not done that but what we do know is 
there's a standard of um, NFPA 1402. There's when you light a fire, there's NFPA standards that you have to meet. Um, we probably did um, go through that um, scenario, but we were told that it was condemned. So that's kind of where we're at. And this is engineering. Um, the engineering. That's what. Yeah, that was what I was told. We were told by the engineering department. Mary, not to put you on the spot, but do we know what it would take to bring this back? But I will say this: that building, it it wouldn't suit the needs of what we need today. That building's uh, this part of this tower that we're planning on building is a three-story residential part, which any one two and three family houses most of our fire fatalities are in those second and third story buildings where um over on garfield ave there was a female named mahogany starling she was in the attic um, she couldn't get out this building um, if you look at the uh design of the proposed building we're going to be able to train our firefighters to stretch a line into the attic more proficiently than they can now and we're just trying to keep uh, people from not being able to make it out of buildings and keeping our firefighters safe. So I think the new safety standards that come with this new building, I think it's, uh, in my opinion, rehabbing that uh, tower that we have now compared to this opportunity we have in front of us with all the other ARPA money that's coming in front of you. To me, this is one of the best things we could spend the money on because it's going to save somebody's life one day, and you can't measure that in money. It's somebody's life you can't measure in dollar signs, and I, I know we have to be responsible, but this training facility is over 80 years old, and we haven't done anything in 25 years to help our firefighters. Um, to help our firefighters. So, I, I just want to say that you know I think the new tower is definitely the way to go. Uh, but can we get an engineering? So what is, what makes this inoperable now? And do we have any idea what it would take to bring it back? Uh, Mary Robinson, city engineer. I'm not familiar with the condition of the existing training tower, um, but a building 80 years old um, probably is in need of substantial renovation if it hasn't been touched. And did you say you want to make the tower higher? To Right. So, I mean, we can take a look at that, but um, renovations are not cheap. Okay. And, and then, if, and if we wanted to expand it to a higher, um, higher height, seven story versus five story, you'd have to look at the foundation, whether the foundation could accommodate those additional stories. And probably 80 years ago, they didn't anticipate having to you know expanding the fight the tower to be higher would it be more effective to build something from the ground up right huh? and has the building codes changed in 80 years i haven't done an analysis of that president hudson but i would say yes i don't know to the extent that they've changed but yes certainly codes have changed in the past century if I could, Chief, uh, just a clarification here. You know, I got the capital <coughs> program from 21, 22, and it's, it's got the training tower. You're going to do it in 23, and they got you down as a million dollars. Yes. So this is twice the training tower? Um, the goal was to request money over two uh, fiscal years to get the, the building, get the site work down, and um, to move forward that way. I'm sure they got just like, it's just a million. And they got two hundred fifty thousand dollars in borrowed funds and seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in the return. Yes, I think initially I asked for one point five million dollars. And one of the things that are going on now that I believe everybody um, knows what's going on with um, construction materials, the prices are skyrocketing. When I first proposed this to uh, the senior staff, I think the price went up thirty percent on all the materials. So the longer um, this is in the hopper, um, the, the goal is to try to secure these. Um, to secure it, get your approval from the council, um, and secure everything we need so we can keep the funds right where we need them to be right now. I know we talked a little bit about the other entities, but so who else has a tower like this in New York State? And um, there, to my knowledge, 
down in New York City. They have us um, something down down in New York City, but there will be nothing of this height um, in any of the areas around here at all. Yeah. I mean, look, Chief, I, the fire department does great work, and I don't mean to be <laughs> yeah. asking questions that, that I'm not. Oh, no. But I think the obvious question for us is, you know, a city like Buffalo, Rochester, has significantly taller buildings, yep. you know, has a fire department without this state-of-the-art facility, and yes, it's a good thing to have, but when we're carefully weighing all these things, is building the best facility in New York State the right use of these funds? And that's, I think, what we're just trying to figure out. So no. part of it for me would be, you know, what are the alternatives, where we can get training, and how do you weigh those overtime costs, and do we have that analysis versus building our own? Okay, I can tell you that the city of Rochester has a um, state-of-the-art facility they built in 2001 um, with some of the same partners that we're looking to um, have a fee schedule with the buffalo fire department has a similar type of training facility that they are able to train their firefighters at we're the fourth biggest fire department in new york state um, downstate westchester county they have a training facility but as you all know it's so dense down there they provide mutual aid between yonkers white plains um new rochelle they're working in and out and they have people that are different departments that they're all career they're all paid that they all have the same interest when you leave outside the city of Syracuse, there's 58 uh, fire departments in the county. Uh, we are the largest. We go on half of the emergency calls in the, in the county. And there are only three other paid uh, fire departments in the county. So um, I would say that the fire service in Onondaga County compared to other places um, is fragmented. And that's why other places have the ability to join in and build things and do stuff like that. So I will, I will get some of the information uh, for you that you're asking for. I might call you to double check to make sure we're getting exactly what you're asking for. Do, do you have an estimate of how much it would cost to maintain this? this well, I believe every, every eight to 10 years, we would have to buy um, panels that go inside the rooms where we provide fire. Um, we would burn fires. Um, we estimated that would be between 10 or $15,000, but um, we would be able to try to observe that in our um, budget every year. And I got to double check on the pricing of that, but that's, that's what we're expecting every eight to 10 years. We would have to realign the paneling of the rooms where we light fires in. And potentially with, with the generated funds from training others, yes. maybe you can mitigate that cost. Um, yes, and you know, I talked to the person who oversees the OCC's program. Um, they want to come down and donate props and they have a they have an, an associate's degree program where um, they graduate and they go all over the, the United States to get jobs from the program I was on the phone with him this morning and um, he wants to partner up and do some things but um, we've been talking for this is like the third going into the fourth year I start I have identified the need to build this tower before I was a chief I had conversations with emergency management you know, but trying to get people to actually come and s submit money to help, um, it's been a lost cause, I would say. And um, it's just hurting our fire department, I would say. See, Chief, I'm just still fixated on this a million dollars when we did this capital thing to be $2 million. So maybe you could give us a breakdown. What's the difference? What are we getting for $2 million that we didn't get for a million that you asked for? So, and that was there's different types of buildings you can get so i got to double check on seat to see what the price is for that but like i was just saying right off the bat you can add 30 percent from when that was approved last october november um, when it was presented to the council well it's in the plan for next year i would say but when i first presented that price it was based off of you know pre-covid before um, um construction material correct so but, yeah, I mean, just it's yeah. you know, I mean, it's something that you know we look over these things, and all of a sudden something like. And and I will tell you this, Councilor Hogan, and to be honest, when I requested that money, we weren't shovel ready. So I requested the money. When we start putting a plan together, we were gonna we were gonna build like a three story. We need we need something more than we got now because right, right now we don't have anything. So as we start putting the plan together and figuring out everything you actually need to be shovel ready, this is the price that we came we came up to. So the request is to spend up to $2 million. Um, we still have to wait for bidding and to see what, you know, right now that prefab building is at $840,000. Hopefully that's um, 
stays the same price, but back when I was asking for that money, there was, um, we had proposals that we, you know, we saw what the price was, and that was kind of based off of that, but the intentions were to use multiple f sources to try to get what we need on top of that million dollars. So that, that was the goal, to use that in conjunction with other things, other streams of money. And that's why the conversations with Fayetteville, DeWitt, trying to figure out a grant. We were, I've, done, I've done all the research of how we can partner. But when you, and we have tons of great conversations, but when it comes time to like commit to spending money with us, that's where the talks just fall off. And that's why I'm here before you now, because it would be the best interest of the city, the firefighters, the citizens we protect, if it was our facility and we can manage it ourselves and let people use it as we see fit. And just to follow up on the Council Hogan's question, so I, I guess this, this, this may be the part where we say, where you have put in your letter that up to $2 million, you could, you could, you may end up using less, right? Uh, certainly. Yeah. Right? Certainly. We have to wait to see what um, the estimates are on the site work and those types of things are, how much it's going to actually cost for the foundation. We got an estimate, a pretty good estimate that that's what it's going to cost, but then that's where the, the dollar amount came from. In Any other questions? I just have to put one sitting in my head. Maybe you said it, Chief, but maybe I missed it. <clears throat> so outside of Rochester and Buffalo, mm -hmm. how many smaller fire departments do we actually help work with coming to our city? So I will say that we get called frequently to go respond. We got called to go up to near Black Lake for a fire. And based on the request, we denied the request to go help them because it was outside of our capabilities to do it. How many of them do we think that if this new innovative tower is built, I mm. mean training facility is mm. built, would we be capable of bringing in other fire departments from our region, because you said the closest one is what, Rochester? Um, that's close to our size. And they have a they have a facility. training facility, yes. And everything in between we, us and Rochester mm -hmm. that would need a training facility is what? Most of those places between here and Rochester are volunteer fire departments. They train in things that I would not want to train in as the fire chief but of a would department. Would they be re re receptive to training in this facility and would it be a cost to them? Um, I believe I believe once we um, put out a marketing plan and let everybody know that there is availability, I think there will be a lot of I think there will be a lot of um, people in fire departments that would want to come and um, actually that would want to come and actually use our facility. And I and I and I uh, I know we're talking about the revenue, and I you know I said the top priority is our safety of our firefighters, but I think in my opinion, and I'm certainly not a CPA or anything to that nature, but I would say us being able to have the New York State Fire Chief show come and provide $16 million, in my opinion, I believe that the money has already came for this tower and they're coming next year and we're working on getting them to come in future years. And, you know, I understand, I understand but that's kind of my thought process by it is it's a way to generate money. I mean, we can have a fee schedule. We'll get thousands of dollars at a time. But when these uh, this show comes in with ten or fifteen thousand people, they're bringing in millions of dollars to the city, restaurants, bars, all those things. And I will just add this too: when you know, when you look at the funding priorities, this tower meets all the criteria of the funding priorities um, to support children and families in neighborhoods. I'm, I've been doing that at Dr. King School. We've elevated that program up to PSLA. Those students are getting opportunities that they never had. No department or this department has never reached out and put their arms around the school district like I have. Never, ever. This program will be the first ever. We're over there, we're giving them OSHA training to be able to work on 81. We're giving them civil service, how to take civil service exams. Um, so we're, we're hitting that priority with the children and families and neighborhoods. Um, transforming infrastructure, building a tower like this, a state-of-the-art tower, in my opinion, is meeting those needs also. But the, the extra benefit is we're going to be able to protect all the initiatives. Um, I come to the council meetings and, you know, affordable housing, um, the 81 project, all these things are going to happen 
And the more I talked, and I, I started talking to Councilor Green about it, and you know, a fire department like ours, we our our resources have been cut tremendously since 1994. We've lost 88 budgeted positions. We've lost 12 on-duty firefighters. When you cover that over four shifts, that's 48 firefighters that we don't have anymore. We've lost six fire companies that are responding in the city. So where all these new developments are happening, when 81 is coming up, where everybody's pushing for this affordable housing and let's build all these lofts, and I think it's a great idea, but at the same time, the people that are sworn to protect it, we're diminishing our resources. <coughs> Over the last decade, there were 14 fire trucks that we should have bought that we never bought that. When, you know, thanks to the council, we were able to, we're almost right where we need to, and that's why I came to the point where I'm asking for a fire training facility. But those 14 fire trucks that we didn't buy over the last decade, based off of a regular scheduled purchasing program that a fire department of our size that protects a city like ours, that was $14 million that we should have been given so we've been cut and cut and cut, and my job is to identify things to make things better. We put together a professional development program to help our firefighters become better, and this training facility will help us overcome some of those statistics that I have on that bullet point. So, Just a comment, uh, uh, this training facility could even expand into inviting other states to be trained here. Uh, like for example, uh, Puerto Rico sometimes sends their, their firefighters to Texas. Yep. If we found something in the East Coast, that would make it a lot you know, more effective. I'd be all for that, Counselor. Mm -hmm. I'd be so all for that. So that could be another, you know, generating. 100%, I'd support that 100%. Mm -hmm. Where is it um, 312 State Fair Boulevard. It's between Genesee Street and Hiawatha Boulevard. Can you say that again? That? Yep. Okay. In the second council district. You excited about it? You know, I I think we have to question any t any expense at all and anything and how we use the ARP, ARPA funding. And you know, I certainly the chief and his fire department is probably the best fire department in the state. We all know that. But every department in the city of Syracuse has undergone cuts over the, since 1994 because yep. literally we don't have a tax base in this city. And, you I, know, and I think sometimes people who work for the city don't realize the financial constraints the city has. You know, mm -hmm. but certainly as we weigh what we, what, what we can spend and what kind of revenue we, we generate, we know it. And we've had to make those tough decisions. So, and, I mean, this is not not something any other department had, that I, hasn't gone through. I, I understand. You know? And certainly, there's members on this finance you know, finance committee. Uh, Councilor Green and myself, Councilor Bay, Councilor Carney. We work with the administration, and we had to make all the tough t decisions on furloughs and layoffs and everything else that through that whole pandemic year. And you know, it was really difficult at night. When I saw my old department, the city parks department, when I knew what we laid off eight, almost 80% of that department during the pandemic, yeah. you know, I mean, so we've all had to make tough decisions and I understand your, and I congratulate on your, your spirit as far as the fire department, mm -hmm. you know, and when I first met you, when I saw one of my heroes in city government, the picture of chief Hanlon behind your, behind your desk, mm -hmm. it certainly struck a chord with me. So I appreciate your, Yep. you know your enthusiasm for this and we'll weigh it that's all and, and i understand i i am i'm not isolating the fire department as the only people that have been cut i'm just speaking on behalf of the department as the fire chief and when i talked to councillor green i think you made a comment to me on the telephone that you know some of the deficiencies that we talked about and um i i believe i can't remember exactly how you stated it but it was it, you know you guys look like you're great from the outside looking in and you know i think I thought about that after we got off the phone, and I and I, I think about this all the time. The reason why, and, and certainly other departments, other um, different types of organizations outside of city government have to make cuts, but the fire department, our Syracuse Fire Department, the reason why it looks like that from the outside in is because our firefighters die. I mean, we've had 42 firefighters die in the line of duty. When they come into the fire station every night, me as a fire chief, based off of the bullet points and the information that I'm telling you that I see the deficiencies, 
they're putting their life on the line to go and protect our city and we're building more buildings and we're doing great economic development. But like I said, our fire department was built originally to handle a certain population and um, a certain amount of buildings and it's been cut and the economic development and all the different construction is going up. And at some point there's a tipping point where we're not gonna be able to protect the city one with the manpower on duty or two they're not going to be trained properly to keep putting out these fires um station seven station six they were they were the downtown companies who went to all the high-rise buildings now station one is that fire station they're the one of the busiest fire companies in new york state when they go on a call because they're always on a call now we're bringing in other companies that historically have never come to these type of buildings and they're in my opinion as a fire chief we need to have a better level of training and um, I, I, I respect um, your questions and I thank you for your time and I'll get back to everybody with their questions I just well, want we, to say thanks we, 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 any other questions Councilor? well let's thank you chief for doing all the best with with what you have uh, that council Hogan said I think you know we we are proud of, of the department and the work that they do um, and and you know, we, we, we know the, the position that the city is in and that you, 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 you make us look good with, with what you got. And, and, you know, we are going to continue to appreciate uh, you for doing that and continue to do the work with, with your team. That's, we thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. I just want to, colleagues, I, I appreciate the questioning and Councillor Green from Finance. I appreciate that, you know, you guys are doing your due diligence. And we talk about all the other departments that had cuts, I, I get that. But if not taking anything from any department, please understand that. But if parks is cut, nobody's gonna die, okay? Fire department, people die. And I, I guess I'm just a little more, I don't know, because I've seen the houses burn up on State Street when six people died in the house. So I guess my thing, all departments did take a cut, but between police and fire, people die when it comes to public safety. Well, President Hudson, you're right. The police and fire, you didn't lay off anybody. Can you say that? You yep. didn't lay off anybody. Cor correct. In the police department. I mean, families lost, you know, substance and things like that. And the other city departments and people were laid off. And I get it. And, and certainly. Paycheck, so, I mean, those are some of the decisions. Certainly, we it was It was tough. I know. I, I don't have to cry. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we were responding. And, I mean, we were going to the we were going to the COVID patients. When they, you close that the engine company up there on Fayette Street, mm -hmm. what prompted my decision to run for mayor the last time because of that? Because I worried about public safety. Mm -hmm. But you know, we have to weigh all this money too. You know, I, so I understand. Not, you know, I just not, I just kind of wanted to you know because you know you know I had a discussion with uh, you, Councilor Hogan and Councilor Green, and you know I think. Um, after I talked to you, it was kind of like, oh, this is a steep ask. But, you know, I, I try to lay out today how it touches everything that the city's doing. All the priority points with the ARPA money, all the affordable housing, the goal of the city that we want to do. The fire department has to be trained to meet those standards or we're going to be putting another name on that plaque. And the last thing I want to come in front of you and say and do like this and just say with the emoji doing this and say, I don't. I try to warn everybody, but I see this happening, and I'm here to tell you today, we need to do something differently with our training division. And, but I, I respect your, your conversation and your opinions and your questions, and I will definitely get back to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I'm good with it. Now, thank you, Chief. Um, question for you. Have we done any assessment especially with with our buildings and our, other things that could potentially like 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 what what is being proposed here to see the potential of of of, of revenues that we could that that could be generated from from, from uh, buildings and facilities that, that, that we allow the community and other agencies to use have we d d done some auditing to see what, what, what could potentially come in and what we are losing? No, not, not in the year and a half that I've been here. We have not, and I don't know any prior institutional awareness of anything. Okay, is, is that something we can do? Um, I, I think from an economic standpoint, it would be Jennifer, um, just in that office in the economic development, they would be able to do that kind of assessment. 
assessment. That's where that would be generated. Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, Keith Cecil. You're not coming here with another towel, are you? What's that? You're not coming here with another towel. No, no, I, we left the most controversial uh, <laughs> uh, item left for the for the last one, which would be neighborhood watch, the budget for neighborhood watch. So, yeah. uh, and there's also an item for uh, a grant, which Janet's going to handle. Janet Burke, but tell um, uh, I have Tony Burrell here. I mean, I could stand up here and tell you the value of neighborhood watch. All of you know it. We work with them as partners. We put out crime prevention tips all the time work when there's a crime trend going on in neighborhoods, but I think you'd probably rather hear from Tony exactly what he does with the budget, how many neighborhood groups he's created and all that kind of thing. Thanks. Hello, Tony. Hello, counselors. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, we're here requesting our annual budget. Um, we have submitted the budget the way we have within the last three years with no changes, um, but we have done um, more um, with the same. Um, we have a great working relationship with SPD. Um, we've been now first year of helping them with doing crime prevention videos <coughs> that we have been putting online, which have been very helpful. Um, staying within our budget, we have done more of the in-house printing and putting more stuff online so the groups can print their own materials. We have increased the number of groups that we have, even though COVID, uh, we, during the COVID time, done a lot of restructuring, which I feel has been beneficial to SPD and the city. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be more happy to answer them. <coughs> well, well, Tony, I just want to express my appreciation for the work that you do. Um, as somebody that have attended consistently neighborhood watch. I have seen the work you do, uh, the, 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 the vast neighborhood that you go to and, 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 and all the connection you have done and it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, I have no question, I just wanted to thank you. And you know, I want to thank yeah. uh, again, the SPD and the counselors. I mean, you guys are at the meetings too and, and that's, that helps me because when you're out there showing support and just helping what we do and promoting what we do, I want to thank you for your efforts and how we, you've helped Neighborhood Watch build connections to the community. Yeah, no, just same, Mr. Brelly, thank you. Uh, you know, I appreciate all the work you do in the community and it's great working with you. You're a great city, so just appreciative. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Ops item. Yes. So the second item is, uh, I think Janet Burke's going to take it. It's a grant item. Thanks. Yeah. This is great. I get to see Janet twice. <laughs> yeah, I love pulling up the end. <laughs> um, so this is a grant that we, Terry Eckert, that up until recently worked in research and then now has not gone to the police department to work on their accreditation, happened to find an accreditation grant when she went over there and it was a two day turnaround. So in order to get administrative money for the accreditation process, she submitted the grant, but unfortunately it went in before we could get approval from the council. So we are asking if we receive the award to be able to go into an agreement with the U.S. Department of Justice for administrative money for the accreditation process for the police department. This is not the same item. It is. It's the one I sent to you. Yes. All right. Any, any questions? Thank you. Is that all, Chief? Yes. Madam President, that's it. That's it for everyone. That's it for everyone. That's it for everybody. John is it?